Salatu was salam ala rasulillahi amma ba'du. Welcome to a new episode of Islam 101. And I'm your host, Abu Usama al Dhabi. Today, inshallah, we would like to discuss the issue of the role of a masjid in al Islam and what is the function of the masjid. Is the masjid a place that we lock the door? And we only open up the masjid when it's time for the prayer? Is this the correct concept of Al-Islam? When I used to be a Christian, the only time we would visit the church would be on Sunday or if someone got married. But during the course of the week, very seldom would we visit the church. It would have to be a special occasion. Well, as Muslims, the situation is totally different. The Muslim is going to visit the masjid a number of times in the course of one day. That doesn't mean that he has to spend all of his time in the masjid. No. He may have a job. He has to work. He may miss a few prayers. But during the course of the week, the Muslim will visit the masjid a number of times because the masjid holds a special place in the heart and the mind of every single Muslim as well as in the religion of Islam. The Messenger of Allah, Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, when he migrated from Mecca and he went to Medina, the very first project that he preoccupied himself with was the building of the masjid because the masjid will serve as the focal point for any and every social activity. And it wasn't just the prayer that caused the people to gather at the masjid. Anytime something happened and Rasulullah needed the people to gather up, he would tell his mu'adhin, his call of the prayer, Bilal, make the adhan, call the people, Ya Bilal. And Bilal would make the call, the well-known call, Allahu Akbar, Allahu Akbar. And the people, once they heard that, and it wasn't time for the prayer, they knew something was going on. The masjid had an important role to play in the lives of every Muslim. If a man in the past wanted to borrow money from another man, that man would agree to give him the money. And they would write the debt at the member or the pulpit, especially in Medina at the member of Rasulullah. Right now, if a man wanted to borrow some money to another man, he would say, okay, I agree, but let's do this at the pulpit of Rasulullah, at the member, so that it would mean something more in the hearts of the people, that the one who's taking the money is going to be more inclined to pay the money because on the day of judgment, that man is going to say, Ya Allah, I gave him my money at the member of Rasulullah and he didn't see any hurma." He didn't see any sacredness and sanctity to that issue. A man wants to marry another man's sister or his daughter. The fathers meet at the member of Rasulullah in the masjid. They can do it at their house. They can do it in the street. They can do it anywhere. But they used to come to the masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa ala alihi wa sallam. The member is an important place or the masjid is an important place. So there are a number of rules and regulations that have come to us in terms of how to act and how to be in the masjid. In the Quran has mentioned many issues concerning the masjid. What I want to do is I want to share with all of you, inshallah, right now, an incident that happened that shows us the importance of the masjid and the role that it plays. And it is concerning a companion by the name of Thumama ibn Uthal. Write his name down. Thumama ibn Uthal. This companion, not many people know about him. And he became famous because of this incident. Thumama was a non-Muslim. And he was the leader of his tribe, Beni Hanif major tribe in the Arab Peninsula. Anytime he found a Muslim Roman in his area, he would get him and kill him. He was against Islam and he was against Rasulullah. May the peace and blessings of Allah be upon him. One day, Thumama, he made what is known as another. He took an oath that I'm going to go and I'm going to perform the Umrah, the smaller visit of the sacred mosque. He wasn't a Muslim, but those people during that time, they used to visit the sacred mosque and they believed in Allah but they had some bad belief systems and things that were against the religion. So Thumama was on his way to perform his Umrah at the sacred mosque. 
one of the companions of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam was on the outskirts of Medina with his other companions, and they saw Thumama. So they went and they caught him, not knowing who they, who he was. They brought Thumama to the Masjid of Rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam, and they tied him up to the pillar of the Masjid. They tied him up. When the Prophet heard that they caught Thumama, he said, "This is an important man." An important man amongst his people. So the Muslims have to recognize who people are and put people in their proper positions, even if they're not Muslims. So you don't speak to your parents the way you speak to your wife. You don't speak to the police officer the way you speak to a non-police officer. You don't speak to your boss the way you speak to someone who is not your boss. You have to put people in their right positions. As Aisha said, Umirna and nunazil nas manazilahum. We've been ordered in this religion to put people in their right places. Rasulullah came one day, the first day, and he said, Ya Thumama, what's your situation? Thumama was tied up and he said, Oh Muhammad, if you kill me, you're going to kill a person whose blood is expensive. I'm an important person with my people. And if you want money, you want to ransom me, I'll pay you a lot of money. Rasulullah left him. He didn't say anything else. The next day he came the second time. Oh, Thumama, what's your situation? Oh, Muhammad. He didn't call him Rasulullah. Oh, Muhammad, if you kill me, you kill a man who is important with his people. My blood is expensive. And if you want to ransom me, I'll give you all the money you want. He left him. The third day, Ya Thumama, what's your situation? The same response as yesterday and the day before Muhammad. My blood is important. I'm a respected person in my community. And if you want blood, if you want the money, I'll give you whatever you ask. Rasulullah said to his companions, let him go. They let him go. Thumama went. He was on his way. He stopped at a wall that was outside of the masjid. He went there behind the wall. He made a ghusl on his own. He washed himself on his own. It was well known. If you want to become a Muslim, a new Muslim, from the sunnah is to wash your whole body and to wash away what is with you from the times that's prior to Islam. He came into the masjid. And then he saw Rasulullah and he said, I bear witness that there's no God worthy of worship. And I bear witness that you are his messenger. And then Thumama became a Muslim. It's a long story that's inside Al-Bukhari and Sahih Muslim. But we don't want to deal with all of the story. We just want to deal with that aspect of the story. And I want to make these points. First of all, what was it that caused Thumama to embrace this religion? When all Rasulullah said to him was three days in a row, Ya Thumama, what's your situation? That's all he said. He didn't tell him about Allah. He didn't tell him about anything about Islam. Ya Thumama, what's your situation? What happened was, while Thumama was tied up in the masjid, the Muslims were feeding him. The Muslims were taking care of him. While Thumama was tied up in the masjid, him being an Arab and a leader of the Arabs, he knew that the Arabs didn't put a lot of emphasis on reading and writing. But while he was in the masjid, he saw there were halakat, where people were learning the religion. Those people reading the Quran, those people being taught Arabic, those people are doing this, they're doing that. While he was in the masjid, he saw the Arab and the non-Arab, the black and the white. He saw them mixing with each other, loving each other, respecting each other. He saw that Bilal would come to the masjid early in the morning and make the adhan, the call to prayer, before the fajr, or during the fajr time, the morning prayer. And people will come out of their homes to come to the masjid at that time in the day. He said, these people must be committed to this religion. He saw how the people looked at Rasulullah and how they respected him. How the people dealt with him. And Thumama being a leader of his people, the way of the Arabs of that time was, they didn't like it. If they, did, if they disagree with you, it was hard to be a leader over the Arabs. Because once they didn't like you, they will push you away and look for another leader. And they will fight each other. But with Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa he saw how the people stood behind him in rows and the rows were straight and organized. He saw how they would listen attentively when he would read the Quran. They wouldn't move until he prostrated, stood up, went down into sajda. When he saw all of that taking place in the masjid, he said, this must be the religion of truth. Here these people, when they're in the masjid, one of them walks around and he has his arrow. This was part of what the Arabs used to use in terms of hunting and their weapons. But the Prophet taught us, anyone who has an arrow, whenever you walk in the masjid, be sure to put the arrow inside of the bait of the arrow where it belongs. Or walk with the arrow and the tip is in your finger. 
You can't walk with the arrow and just, you grab it in the middle and you're walking. Maybe someone will run, a child runs into the arrow and then you kill the child or you hurt another Muslim. So Mama saw all of this and he saw that his people were changing as a result of what was taking place in that masjid. So this is the example of the role of the masjid in the religion of Al-Islam. The masjid is not a place that is just a symbol. Yes, it is a symbol of Al-Islam. As Allah mentioned in so many eyes of the Quran, ذَلِكَ وَمَنْ يُعَذَّمْ شَعَائِرَ اللَّهِ فَإِنَّهَا مِنْ تَقْوَ الْقُلُوبِ Whoever raises up and he exalts the sha'air, the institutions of Allah, that's a sign that he has taqwa. إِنَّ الصَّفَى وَالْمَرْوَى مِنْ شَعَائِرَ اللَّهِ So if someone respects Safa and Marwa, they respect the Kaaba, they respect the hijab of the woman. They respect the adhan. They respect the masjid. They respect the silat al-rahm between the mother and the father and the relatives. This is a proof that the person has a great iman. He respects the Quran. He doesn't take the Quran and, and just do anything with the Quran. He acts a certain way with the Quran. That's a proof that that person has some fear of Allah in his heart. So the masjid is like that. It has a lot of rights upon us. And it plays a, an important role in the masjid. The Prophet came one time to the masjid. And when he came to the masjid, he found that someone made a spit. They spit towards the qibla. And the spit was on the wall in the direction of the qibla. He was about to tell the people to get ready for prayer and he saw it. He took his own fold, took his own fold, and he wiped it off. He turned around to the people and he said, when one of you wants to spit, do not spit towards the qibla. Why? Because the direction of the prayer, we have to respect it. So the Muslim, when he goes to the bathroom, if he has to relieve himself, he doesn't do so towards the qibla. He doesn't face it, nor does he put his back to it. Al-Islam came to deal with all of the aspects of our lives. I want to build a house, I'm going to be sure that the muhandis, the man who's going to design my house, that he makes it so that the qibla is either to my right or my left, and I'm not facing it front or the back. Everything in the religion of Islam has been dealt with. And that's why I say if you're not a Muslim, then you should take it very seriously and you should be sincere. Try to look into the religion of Islam. And that's what we're trying to do here at Islam 101. We're trying to give you a basic concept and understanding. What is our religion all about? We don't want you to take the lessons of Islam and the, 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 what our religion is saying from people who are extremists to the right or the left. No, take it from the authentic sources. So when... The masjid, the messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he prohibited us from spitting towards the qibla. He prohibited us. If someone were to lose something in the masjid, he cannot get up and start saying, hey, I lost my thing in the masjid. I lost my shoes. I lost my wallet. Rasulullah said, if you hear someone do that, then make the dua, supplicate and say, la raddaha Allah alayhi. May Allah keep it from you. May Allah not give it back because he's compromising the sacredness and the sanctity of the masjid. We'll be back, inshallah, after this break with the participation of our students. So we hope to see you in the second half of this episode. Islam 101 Those who love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, for those who worship Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala alone, for those who want to enter the Jannah, the paradise that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala created for the believers, that's why we need to learn and we need to get to know what Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala wants from us so that we submit ourselves to the orders of Allah. This is knowledge that we need to learn. That's why we're spending more time to look into the verses and to the meanings of the verses in depth so that we can get to learn from it what we need ourselves to be steadfast, to be obedient to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, to ponder over the meanings of the miraculous words of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Islam 101. Welcome back to Islam 101, where we've been discussing the importance of the masjid in Al-Islam and the rights of the masjid and the function and the role of the masjid. It was the masjid of Al-Islam that sent forth in the past those people who went to the four corners of the universe and they spread the religion of Al-Islam. It was the masjid in Al-Islam that created and developed for us our four imams, those illustrious imams, who were the leaders of the four schools of thought. When they were young, 
They memorized the Qur'an in the masjid. They learned about the fiqh and the sciences of Al-Islam in the masjid. It is the masjid in Al-Islam where we get to know who's sick and who's not sick because when the person disappears from the masjid, we begin to ask, where is so-and-so and where is so-and-so? Why haven't we seen him in the last two days? Then we know something must have happened. Either he traveled or something is going on. So we go and we look for that individual. So the masjid in Al-Islam is too important and it is an obligation. If the man could do so, to make the salat of the obligatory prayers in the masjid. And when we go to the masjid, every right step that is taken, there's a good hasana written, and every left step that is taken, there is a bad sin that is taken off. And the athar, or the footsteps that we leave in the masjid, we're going to find them with Allah yom al qiyamah. So going to the masjid is a tremendous benefit. There are not a group of people. There's not a group of people who come together in one of the houses in the houses of Allah, meaning the masjids. They read the Quran and they study it amongst themselves. Except that the mercy of Allah comes down upon them. And the angels come down and they surround them. وَذَكَرَهُمُ اللَّهُ فِي مَنْ عِنْدُهُ And Allah mentions them with those who are with Him. Seven people Allah was shade in His shade on the day where there would be no shade. And one of those individuals is the man who his heart was connected to the masjid. He will go and he will pray and then when he leaves, he's waiting to come back to the masjid again. He is from the Ahlul Masjid. So the masjid in the religion of Al-Islam, it holds a unique and a special position. Any Muslim who doesn't visit the masjid during the course of the, 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 the day or the week, then he has to make the tuhma about his Islam. I say that for any and everyone who's watching this particular program or listening. If you are a Muslim and you never visit the masjid and you don't know what's in the masjid or how your local masjid is, then you have to start to ask, what is the reality of your Islam? Are you just a Muslim who is, I'm, an, I'm a Muslim by my name and that's it? Because the Muslim men are connected to the masjid. As it relates to the masjids of Al-Islam and going to the masjid, the Prophet of Al-Islam used to bring his grandchildren to the masjid, Hassan and Hussein, his granddaughter Umama. He would carry Umama while he used to pray. The companions, they said, in the month of Ramadan, we would bring our children to the masjid and they would fast. And when they became hungry and it was close to the time of breaking the fast, they would start becoming disruptive and making noises. So what we would do is we would give them the toys like the dolls and things like that to play with them. A proof that they used to fast and the companions used to bring them to the masjid, teaching them about the masjid. So the father, he has to take his son, have his son to come with him to the masjid. And the masjid also, Ikhwani brothers, is a place where the women used to be allowed to go. Prophet's mosque has a door in his masjid called Babu Nisa. It's still there, the door for the women. And in that place, the women used to go in and out. That was the only door that the women would go in and out of during the time of the Messenger of Allah. And it is not permissible for the husband to prevent his wife from going to the masjid. This is not his rights. Do not prevent the handmaidens of Allah from the masjid of Allah. So one of Umar's sons, his name is Bilal, he saw and he had jealousy for his wife. He said, you can't go to the masjid anymore because I don't want other men to see you. Even if you're dressed up, I don't want them to see you. So she complained to his father, who was the leader. So when he, she compl he complained to his father, who was Abdullah ibn Umar, not Umar the Khalifa, his son Abdullah. So that son Bilal said, to his father, yes, I keep her from the masjid because there's fitna and fasad, confusion. There's, um, I'm jealous for her. So the father told him the hadith that the prophet said, "La tamna'u ama Allah min masajidillah. Don't stop that women from coming to the masjid. The boy said, Wallahi, I'm going to continue to keep her from the masjid. The father said, I tell you that Rasulullah says something. You swear and say, Wallahi, you're going to continue to do that wrong thing. The father swore and said, Wallahi, I'll never talk to you again. And he never talked to his son because here his son is disrespecting the sunnah, disrespecting al-Islam. The son is not higher than the sunnah, he's not higher than the religion of al-Islam. How is he going to swear like that? So the point is, 
The masjid in Al-Islam is for everyone. But the Muslim sister should know her prayer in her home is better than the prayer in the masjid. And if she goes to the masjid, she should not have nice smells on her. She should not go in order to be an, an attraction to the men, be a fitna for the men. So the masjid in Al-Islam, ikhwani, especially those of us who are young and we're in our youth, the shabab from this ummah, you should try to get as much good deeds in your book for Yom Al-Qiyamah right now. Walk into the masjid, walk in from the masjid. So we have to learn about the ahkam, the rules and regulations. What can be done in the masjid? What shouldn't be done in the masjid? How to go to the masjid? And all of this has been recorded in the books of Al-Islam. The issue is too important, but time doesn't allow for us to continue. So we're going to stop here, inshallah, and we're going to open up the door for the questions. We'll deal with Muhammad's question, and then Brother Nuhal's question, inshallah, and then Umar's question, and then Akh Muhammad Hussein's question. Well, uh, my question is, is it allowed for us for to travel to mosques or to masjids? The Messenger of Allah said concerning uh, traveling long, long distances that it's not permissible to travel a long distance with the intent of visiting the masjid except for one of the three masjids in Al-Islam. The main sacred mosque in Mecca, you can travel there and to pray there is 100,000 prayers, rewards. Any prayers 100,000 times. You can pray and travel to Medina. One prayer there is 1,000 times. You can pray at Beit al-Maqdis in Jerusalem. Our masjid, the masjid of Beit al-Maqdis, where Suleiman built that mosque. And the prayer there, Ikhwani, is 250. And it's not 500 as you'll find in some of the books of fiqh. It is 250 to pray in Beit al-Maqdis. But to travel to the masjid of Sayyid Badawi, to travel to the masjid of Sheikh Glow in the Dark, to travel to the masjid of this one or that one, you cannot do such a thing. Only those three masjids. Okay, I heard some Muslim in America, they, uh, they did a Jum'at prayer or Friday prayer in the church. Is it permissible? Concerning the prayer in the church, there is nothing that would prevent us from praying in the church and the religion except if there's a proof. And there is a proof. Umar radiallahu anhu, when he went to accept the keys to Jerusalem, he took the keys and he was in the church and he was looking at what was in the church and he was talking to the leader of the Christians of that area. And then it was time for the prayer. And the time for the salat came. The man said, Umar, why don't you pray over here? We'll accommodate you. He said, no. I don't want to pray in here because I don't want the Muslims to think that this is something that could be or should be done after me. So Umar and his sunnah should be followed, which goes to show that those people who, f who prayed in that church, they are astray. They're astray because they wanted a lady to lead them in the Friday prayer itself. She gives the sermon and she leads them in salat. They're astray because the men and the women were sitting in the rows together. They're astray because they were praying in the church. So all of those were signs that they were astray. May Allah forgive us and forgive all of the Muslims. And may Allah help us to understand our religion the correct way. Akhi, okay. Well, uh, in my area, uh, there were 10 mosques. I think that uh, distinguish Muslims in my area. And I think that uh, only one mosque is enough to union uh, Muslims in my area. I haven't seen your area, so I can't really comment. Okay. But what we want to do is we want to always keep the Muslims united. There were a group of people who, in Medina, they built another mosque unnecessarily. And the mosque is the French term for masjid. They built a mosque. And their intent behind building that mosque was to divide the Muslims, to make a tafriq, meaning to separate themselves. There was no need for that. So Allah revealed the verses, and he called that masjid, Masjid al-Dirar. Masjid al-Dirar. The masjid that's harmful and hurtful. Why? Because it's designed to make problems, to divide the Muslims. So if that's what's going on in your area, whatever area, then it is similar to that. But let's say that the area is a large area, wherever you come from. And there are multiple messages for each sector of that neighborhood. Then there's nothing wrong with that. There's nothing wrong with that. That may even be from the Rahmah of Allah. Because there are old people who want to pray in the, mas in the masjid. So that one is close to him. How if it was one masjid, he has to walk way over there? The blind man who lives next to the masjid, his son, his daughter, his little granddaughter can take him to the mosque that's close to his house. So it could be from the rahmah of Allah as long as it's not designed to make fitness. So there's no problem with that. 
Actually, I got uh, two questions. The first one, uh, I want to ask about uh, the sleeping in the, in the mosque. It's permissible to sleep in the masjid because during the time of Rasulullah, there was the poor people who used to sleep and stay in the masjid. From them, Abu Huraira stayed there for some time. Abdullah ibn Umar, whose father had money. His father had money, but his father didn't give his boy the money so that the boy can develop his own personality. Because the hand that is up is better than the hand that's receiving. So we have to learn as young people, young men of this ummah, we have to learn to be self-sufficient, to be hard workers, to be productive. Umar could have easily supported his son, but he said, no, you support yourself. So there was a time where he used to sleep and stay in the masjid. So it's permissible. And the things that happens to a man when he's sleeping in his home, what happened to them in the masjid? As it relates to when he needs a ghusl and things like that. So he can just get up and he just goes and he makes the ghusl. Concerning the rules and the regulations of the masjid. If someone steals from the masjid, you steal the people's shoes from the masjid. This is a kabira from the kabair. If you go into the sadaqa box, the zakat box in the masjid and you steal that money. A kabira from the kabair. To waste the money of the masjid. To deface the masjid. To write graffiti in the masjid. This is a, it is the worst thing to do. It is the worst thing to do. Also, from what is not permissible to do in the masjid is to establish the hudud. Rasulullah said, don't establish the hudud in the masjid. Don't cut people's hands off and make this in the masjid. The Bedouin man came to the masjid and the Bedouins, they live in the desert. And they're rough and tough people. Wherever you go in Afghanistan, the people live in the frontiers. They're tough. Tougher than the people live in Kabul. Wherever you go. The Prophet told us men... Beda Jaffa, the one who lives in the Badia in the desert, he's rough, he's tough. The man came to the masjid and he exposed his aura and he went to the bathroom in the masjid in front of everyone and he put najas in the masjid. But the Prophet ﷺ dealt with him in a nice way and the point is he said, these masjids are not built for the qadarat, for the filth of the people. It's not built for that. It's built for the salat, it's built for reading the Quran, it's built for the dhikr, remembrance of Allah. So don't do these things. Spit in the masjid. Go to the bathroom in the masjid. Throw your garbage in the masjid. We're going to stop here. Muslims, return back to the masajid. And let's make the masjids what they used to be during the time of the Messenger of Allah. And if you are non-Muslim, some masjids have places that can accommodate you. Go and visit your local masjid with respect so that maybe you can learn more about the religion of Islam. So we ask Allah to guide you all and to protect you all and to accept it from us and from you. هذا وصلى الله وسلم على النبيين الأمين والسلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته. Islam.